All right. So as Adam said, my name is Bart Best. I am a uh, I'm a geotechnical engineer with the RMC here in Louisville. Um, I also serve as a, um, a program manager for our Eastern Division um, dams. So uh, I work with uh, our different districts around the country and our different teams around the country to on our risk assessments that are working on the, the on the eastern side of the the United States. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about. Um, Set, uh, modules A3 and A4, which is potential failure modes and semi-quantitative risk set, risk analysis. All right, so learning objectives. Identify and describe the failure modes. Describe the what information is needed to develop the failure modes. Summarize how a potential failure mode analysis or PFMA is accomplished. Explain how to screen failure modes and prepare for risk analysis. List the most common failure mechanisms and identify and describe more and less likely factors. So what are the what are the key things we're going to try to get out of, you know, this A A3 module? Uh, the PFMA is a foundation of our risk and risk analysis. So this is where we figure out what the potential failure modes we have in the dam. So it's really it's really kind of the most important thing to kind of get involved in. A uh, diverse team is important. We all we all think differently. We all look at things differently. Our experiences are different. So when we say diverse team, we're not talking just a bunch of engineers sitting in the room. We're talking a truly a diverse team. People that are experienced on the project every day, people that are, you know, that have knowledge of, of the dam. We want their input. We want to know what they see. Um, thorough review of the information is critical. Of course, we want to know what's going on and examine how structures fall, uh, fail versus how structures are designed is important. So A4, the learning objectives are outlined how to complete a semi quantitative risk analysis. We we give the acronym of SQRA for that. Describe why an SQRA should be completed. Um, so our key concepts here are reasonable selection of likelihood and consequence categories. We'll get into more of that when we get going through the presentation. Understand how to combine loading and response probabilities to uh, to guide the category selection. Again, I'll give you more information on that. Understand the impor uh, importance of uncertainty and category selection. Understand limitations of SQRA and understand what SQRA results can be used for. So, we have different levels of risk analysis in the core and in reclamation, and we have different levels that we like to use those things for. All right, so let's start out on the, the, the overall kind of foundation of what we're looking for. So, that's the PFMA. Uh, so, potential failure mode is defined as a unique set of conditions and or sequence of events that could result in the failure or breach. Um, the FEMA guidance that uh, Adam was talking about that categorizes failure as the sudden, rapid, and uncontrolled release of impounded water or liquid borne solids. So, as Adam kind of talked about, that's it can that can be defined in a lot of different ways, but that's something we didn't plan to release, and that happened as a result of something that we were dealing with. Um, so it's recognized that there are lesser degrees of failure, and that any amount malfunction or abnormality outside the design assumptions and parameters that adversely affect a dam's primary function or impoundment of water is properly considered as a failure. The, these lesser degrees of failure can progressively lead to or heighten the risk of a catastrophic failure. They are, however, normally amenable to corrective action. That's from that's a direct quote from a FEMA, FEMA guidance. Um, and USACE also considers the loss of service PFMs for navigation projects, which could have significant economic consequences, but no life safety risk. So we're talking locks and dams in that that regard. You know, we lose something, we lose the ability to to operate our locks and dams. There's a there may not be a life safety risk associated with that, but there is an economic consequence. You know, if you go walk outside and watch the barges heading up and down the river, there there can be a huge economic consequence if we have to shut that lock down for a period of time. All right, so PFMA, that's the potential failure modes analysis. So first we talked about what a PFM was. Now we're talking about the potential failure modes analysis. It's a facilitated process of identifying and fully describing potential failure modes based on a diverse team's understanding of the project's vulnerabilities from a review of the existing data and conditions. So in our PFMA, we're really just looking at what are what do we have and what what do we think are the possible scenarios for this dam failing and like i talked about earlier we're, we're looking for that diverse team at this point we're looking for the project staff that works there all the time we're looking for the people that have experience on this thing what goes wrong what happens when you flip the switch all those kind of things all dams are unique and has specific vulnerabilities and potential failure modes so pfma is the first and probably the most critical step in any risk analysis 
Therefore, it is the blueprint for performing the risk analysis. It must be done in a diligent and thorough manner using a diverse multidiscipline team, including operations personnel who are most knowledgeable of the project and most qualified by their ed and, and most qualified by their education and experience of the projects to evaluate the structure. All right, so let's talk about the key concepts of a PFMA. Think beyond the traditional standards based analysis. So this is not the, hey, we ran a slope stability analysis and the guidance says it's bad if it breaches this number. We're looking for actual failures. We're not necessarily looking for design standards. We're looking for failures. So there's a little bit different way that we try to look at things. Uh, beware of the oddball, you know, uh, consider malfunctions and I and improper operations. What things could we do that don't work? Like we go to flip the switch to open up a spillway gate and we can't open up the spillway gate. It, something's wrong. So, well, if a flood's keeping coming, coming up and we're planning on a certain amount of releases going out the spillway and we can't operate the gate anymore, we can get to a failure somewhere in that, that regard. That malfunction can lead to an ultimate failure of the structure. Think like a detective or a coroner. Look at you're looking at forensics. Look look for sus, uh, susceptibilities and vulnerabilities. You know what what are you thinking of when what are, try to put yourself in the mindset of what these people were thinking of when they designed the project. You know is there something we've learned now that they maybe didn't know then. Um, you know a lot of times we can look at different districts and we can see what kind of projects were being built in the area at the time and what kind of problems they were experiencing and. Maybe this was an early on, and maybe the next dam you go to down the road, they learned a lot from that last one when they started construction on there. They've done a heck of a lot more here. So how do those things kind of go together? So PFM and PFMs can cross disciplines. Um, so that's what we're talking about, those multidiscipline teams. Uh, they're giving you kind of an example here. Seismic deformation of a concrete structure, leads to inundation um, of internal erosion of the embankment. I threw out the can't open the gate leads to overtopping of the dam. Well, if you know, if we have a gate, we can't open it up there, but we maybe we have an embankment dam. You know, we're starting to cross disciplines between a mechanical electrical issue over here at this gate and a an erosion issue of water coming over the top of the dam. All right, background and performance data is essential to complete and thoroughly review all available do, uh, design documentation and reports, including as built drawings, construction records, and photographs, foundation reports, design memorandums, seismic studies, special investigations, inspection reports, and incident, incident reports. Other sources of data, such as uh, project offered records, national archives, university public libraries, uh, may need to be investigated. Uh, background data, including design, construction, geology, geometry, any other pertinent data, while performance data includes operations, instrumentation, monitoring, performance history, including frequency of high pools and record pools. Backgrounds of performance data are often discussed first because it helps get the team on the same page to understand the PFMs, prepare, prepare good descriptions. So it's a lot of words. Um, what, what's important? There's lots of important documents out there, lots of important things to read. Again, again, putting yourself in the mindset of what that team was doing when they designed the dam. Also putting in yourself in an understanding of what has been seen over the history of the dam. What do you what have they seen? What have, what things did they do? What did they do to fix it? Like, is this a indication of a larger problem or is this an indication of a small problem? small issue that they've already addressed. You know, try to get yourself in that mindset so you can figure out what the next step is. So brainstorming. During brainstorming session, the facilitator elicits uh, candidate PFMs from the team based on their understanding and the vulnerabilities of the project from reviewing background data, performing data, uh, performance data, and their experience. These are often written on flip charts with short titles and descriptions. Team brainstorm PFMs and then go back and evaluate each one. Common failure mechanisms are described in chapter A3 and, th and throughout the manual. For PFMs that are not expected to contribute significantly to the risk, clearly document the reasons for excluding them from further evaluation. The team should discuss and agree on the PFMs that are potentially contribute to the, mo the most to the risk. These we typically refer to as risk driver PFMs, and it should not be just one person's opinion nor should the team just accept the previous failure mode screening. So sometimes we, at the core, we do these over and over and over again. 
We, we do them on cycles. So just because one team came up with an idea doesn't necessarily mean you have to keep their idea. Um, I would also say that make sure you, you're not really stifling anybody's creativity here. There, there are times when some, some oddball potential failure modes get thrown out there that you, you kind of want to scoff at. But uh, there are some times when you originally want to scoff at it, and as you start thinking about it, maybe it makes a little bit more sense. So make sure you give everybody the opportunity to voice their opinion, write everything down, and then, like it says, you're going through those, you're looking at them. Does that really make sense? Talk about it as a group. You're kind of making a group decision as to what's going on and which there. You know, I was doing a levy project out in Sacramento and there was an airport right next to the levy. And, you know, one of the operations staff threw out the idea of basically a, um, a plane gets hijacked and they crash it into the levy during, the, during, during a flood. Is that really gonna happen? Probably not. It's probably a low probability event of that happening. But is it is it a potential failure mode? I guess you know we could. It, it don't we don't we didn't discount that person's opinion. But we talked about like, hey, what's the what's the potential of the of your initiating event here of someone hijacking this plane? Like, okay, maybe that's pretty low. Or what are the normal failure rates of a of a plane actually crashing? Like, you know, we can look those things up. We can find those. Well, that may end up being an extremely low probability event. So before we even get to the next step of the actual like loss of the structure, we've already we've already said that failure mode probably isn't going to happen. So the elements of a failure mode description. There are three main components to writing a PFM description: the initiator, the failure mechanism, and the resulting impact on the structure. You want to clearly identify and focus on the weakest links. This means that the risk for a particular PFM is estimated at the location where the risk is judged to be the greatest. If the team starts with a well-written PFM description, then they are likely to end up with a good in-depth assessment. The description can, later can be translated into an event tree for a full quantitative risk analysis. Again, a lot of words. I'm gonna break, try to break these down for you as I go. My interpretation of that is if you, if you really have a hard time writing how it's gonna happen, it probably isn't gonna happen. Okay, so simple. If it's, if it's really complicated for you to figure out, and you guys can't figure out how to get from point A to point B, then it probably isn't gonna happen. So think about that as you kind of, it's good to kind of write through these ideas. So examples of a failure mode description. Um, you know, the top description is a summary of the, uh, the summary description that might be used as a headline or title or, or initially captured on a flip chart. It really doesn't describe everything in enough detail. So we are looking at it just kind of, this one fits that like, you know, piping from an embankment. That's a good way of just a short little blurb for everybody to kind of have a general idea of what's going on. But that doesn't describe everything. What's going on below there is really your, your failure mode description. Um, so it's how, how it would be fleshed out to include the, the three components. Whoops. So the bottom description is how it would be fleshed out to include the three components of a good potential failure mode. Underlining is, um, is added for emphasis, including sketches of the potential failure mode for the internal erosion uh, potential failure mode is important to clearly identify where the erosion initiates, in this case, at the unprotected exit. Include sketches to show the failure pathway of the sequence. Again, a lot of words. Picture says a thousand words is really the point of, of what you're saying there. So adverse, more likely factors. Here's some examples of adverse, more likely factors that make the PFM more likely to occur. Provide pertinent data on the loading conditions, defenses, and events that make this potential failure mode more likely to occur. The normal text shows how they might be captured on a flip chart and the uh, italicized text, which is actually not on here, um, shows how they would be written in the, up in the report. Um, so what it's kind of saying, like generally, we're looking for, when we're writing them on the flip chart, you can't write this whole big, huge, long paragraph on everything, or we'd all be sitting there all day trying to write everything down. So you're gonna write a short description that gives you, that gives it, everybody's gonna generally understand what you're talking about. But when you're going to write a port, report, we're actually gonna wanna know how we get all the way to an adverse factor that's gonna cause a failure to occur. That makes sense?
So less likely factors. Here's an example of favorable, uh, favorable factors that make the PFM less likely to occur. So again, we're going to do the same kind of thing. We're going to have a short little blurb of, of what it's, what it looks like. And then we're going to have a long statement in the report that tells us, um, you know, how we kind of, how it, it, it's a good factor for the thing. It makes it less likely to occur. Review consequences of failure. Again, Adam pointed this out early on that consequences are a big piece. Sometimes they get stuck at the end, but they're extremely, extremely important to pay attention to. Um, if you have a, if you have a failure of a, of a, of, of a spillway, but it doesn't produce a whole lot of water and therefore it doesn't, uh, end up having a lot of consequences. Is it really as important as something maybe that is less likely to occur, but has a lot more consequences? You know, we need to think of it that way in that kind of sloping line on that chart that he was talking about, that he was showing us earlier. So ideally there, there will be detailed consequences evaluation, but sometimes there is no such, uh, there's not, not such for studies. Sometimes we don't have everything. Sometimes we have to kind of do, do the best that we can. In any case, it's important for us for the team to have a good understanding of the downstream conditions and to not prematurely rule out a PFM with low consequences if it has a high likelihood of failure. This essentially concludes the PFMA portion of a risk assessment. USACE integrates PFMA with SQRA to evaluate the significance of the PFMs. How USACE, USACE, USACE screens PFMs using SQRA is discussed in the next part of the presentation. So I'll, I'll pause here for any, any questions on the PFMA portion. Thanks. Uh, do we typically include or consider PFMs that have malicious initiators? You can, you um, and there's no there's no reason for it. If <laughs> if there's a history of it at the project, then then you know for uh, for example, if um, you've got some kind of issue where you've got people that are breaking into the to the control house and messing around with things and they keep having to make repairs. I mean, you want to think about things along those regards. Now they may not end up being something high or you might be able to intervene very easily to fix it, but yeah, that's, that's something because it could easily be something that maybe it's not a risk driving failure mode, but maybe it comes out as a recommendation to the project staff, okay. uh, something that needs to be done to prevent this from occurring the next time. Um, I know, you know, project staffs have a lot of issue with with riprap being thrown into the stilling basin. It may not necessarily lead to a failure of our of our dam, but it does tear things up, and it could, you know, right. there could be something they could do later. So, absolutely, okay. Thank it could you. be an operation and and maintenance type issue, but from a malicious standpoint, in terms of like terrorism things like that, we generally don't consider those type scenarios. Um, so I know you mentioned like the operator in the Sacramento levy. So on these like brainstorming, would you have non-federal levy sponsors participate in those? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, having the sponsors in the room during these discussions can be extremely valuable and definitely necessary. And we even bring invite uh, levy sponsors and uh, to our um, our briefing meetings. Yeah, we've, we've found engaging with the levy sponsor is, is just, it, it's a great best practice. There's just lots of, there's lots of information that they have that they can bring to it, but it also gives us that kind of like interaction between the two and the trust ability that kind of goes with it, where we feel like we can all kind of talk about things together. All right, any more? All right, so let's get into the, the SQRA portion of this. Um, so. Estimates of likelihood of failure and associated consequences can be shown in a risk matrix where the greater the likelihood and the greater the consequences, the higher the, the higher the risk. A risk matrix, risk matrix is a portrayal of the communication tool to compare projects and evaluate risk tolerability. USACE uses risk estimates to categorize each project in the context of portfolio and to determine the most appropriate risk management actions. The little chart up here kind of showing you that, you know, more risk, more consequences, like, you know, it goes back to that chart that Adam showed right at the beginning. They all kind of relate together. All right, so let's talk about the definition of risk here. 
So risk is defined as the measure of, of the and likelihood of the likelihood and severity of consequences of, of inundation associated with the presence of flood risk management infrastructure. So in, incremental risk is the is the dam or levee risk due to failure or breach. So the slide shows that the basic equation for incremental risk and the correlation between QRA and SQRA. So what you're looking at here, the AEP thing that pop, popped up, that's kind of our probability of loading, and the SRP is is kind of the um, the probability of failure given the loading. So if we break that down into the quantitative versus uh, semi-quantitative approach, the likelihood of failure and annual probability failure, the APF, is on the top there, um, are the functions of both the hazard, which is the loading, and the performance, which is the system response. And th uh, this is primarily the primary difference between the QRA and SQRA, um, whereas we're, we're looking at a single order of magnitude estimate is made for APF for an SQRA, where a fragility curve are developed and combined with the flood frequency to calculate the APF for the QRA. So what again, what does that mean? We're coming up with one little we're coming up with one spot on the SQRA. We're like, you know, what do we think the the highest problem of uh, potential for both of them are? But when we're doing a QRA, we're looking at a full range of of information and we're combining those together to to look at it. So the the SQRA is really supposed to be kind of, you know, that kind of first step screening just to kind of see what's really going on here. So, when the APF is multiplied by the incremental life loss given breach, we get the societal incremental life safety risk or average annual life loss. So, SQRA uses a combination of limited numerical estimates of the hazard and performance, but not fragility curves, that result in the order of magnitude risk estimates. It can be a more efficient process than QRA with the primary objective of making easy decisions on a project's risk characterization and to prioritize risk management actions and studies. It's also important to perform an initial screening of the risk driver PFMs. FERC uses a, a, a four category system that lumps likelihood, consequences, and competence into a single rating. And USACE considers these separately and the risk matrix approach provides more resolution to the risk. SQRA is a primary means of assessing risk in the USACE periodic assessment program and for levy risk assessments. SQRA is also performed at the beginning of the full QRA to evaluate the risk characterization to justify the need for higher level studies and to identify the significant PFMs to be evaluated as part of the QRA. So I'll break that down a little bit, a little bit for you. So when we're, when we're trying to screen things, when we're doing our normal periodic assessment cycles through the core, which we do on a 10 year cycle. We're looking at an SQRA process just to kind of see where things break out and make decisions as to whether that makes sense to do more study or not. When we're doing our, our levies, we're doing it very, we're doing it very similar. We're trying to kind of get a, a, a goal of what's really, what's really driving our things. Now, when we're looking at dams, the ones that kind of float towards the top will do a QRA on it. It takes longer. It's it's more difficult. We usually do some additional analysis that goes along with them, but we're trying to kind of make sure that we're prioritizing where we're spending money and how we're how you're evaluating structures so that we're looking at the ones that have high risks and the other ones we will get to them, but maybe they're not as high as a risk right now. So the overview of the SQRA process. USACE integrates PFM, PFMA with SQRA to evaluate the significance of the PFMs. The general steps are summarized on this slide. After reviewing all available background performance data, um, data diligently, a brief site visit is recommended. It is not an inspection, but rather it is focused on the vulnerabilities associated with the PFMs. The team should review the loading information and consequence data described in parts B and C of the manual respectively. So. It's good to see things. It's good to see the structure. You've read all, you're sitting in a room, you read all about everything, you know what's going on. It's time to keep going. After the, uh, this advanced 
advanced preparation, the team will brainstorm PFMs, which will then be categorized as risk drivers and non-risk drivers. The rationale for the PFM being risk drivers, uh, being a risk non-risk driver is documented for each potential failure mode. The PFM is discussed and evaluated, and the risk is classified on the matrix. Lastly, recommendations for additional instrumentation and monitoring risk risk reduction data or analysis are discussed. All right, let's keep going. The first step followed following brainstorm is to identify those PFMs that are clearly or either non-credible or not expected to contribute significantly to the total incremental risk. An example would be a failure triggering, triggered by an extreme event with low incremental consequences. The detailed reasons for excluding these for, from further evaluation should be clearly documented for significant hazard potential projects, such as navigation projects. Evaluate at least one risk driver associated with the damming surface to characterize the dam safety risk. The risk drivers for uh, navigation projects are usually loss of service PFMs, which only pose significant economic, but no life safety risk. Uh, discuss, agree on the PFMs that are potentially contributing most to the risk. Suggest discussing perceived greatest vulnerabilities by location. The total incremental risk for the project is generally, generally driven by one or two PFMs. These will be the risk drivers and will help manage the number of failure modes that get carried forward for a full SQRA. So a general elicitation process. During the elicit elicitation process, each team member should write down their estimate, their estimates down to force them to think about and to avoid bias from hearing others' responses. Facilitators then collect and review those estimates. Although the first round is submitted anonymously, after all estimates are collected and reviewed, outliers must, must be discussed, which means no, uh, no more anonymity. Uh, one team member may have a totally different interpretation of the data or expected performance, and it is important to understand why. The rest of the team may need to adjust their estimates, or the outlier may, need to mis, uh, mis, uh, may have misinterpreted the data. A second round of elicitation should be conducted, if, if necessary, to arrive at a team consensus. Each risk driver PFM can be listed at, on post-it notes and placed on the incremental risk matrix on the wall. Different colors can be uh, can help different, different, differentiate structures or elements. Estimating the likelihood of failure. There are three approaches for estimating the likelihood of failure. The historical failure rate of the dam is about 1 in 10,000 per dam year or of our operation if the key factors affecting the pfm are weighing towards adverse more likely the pfm is probably greater than one in ten thousand if the key factors are weighing towards favorable less likely the pfm is probably less than one in ten thousand chapter a3 provides uh, quantitative descriptions for failure likelihoods to relative to this failure rate which core consider all the dam worldwide uh, regardless design and construction attention. Therefore, this method may not be appropriate for all projects. For levees prior to overtopping PFMs can be compared to, e e to the frequency of overtopping and breach. The critical loading is approach to the most common approach for the for normal operating conditions. The likelihood of failure is high. However, for floods or earthquakes, the likelihood of failure of loading could be small. Teams will estimate the loading with the most likely to require the initi initiating of the PFM and consider the likelihood of failure or breach given the critical loading. If the same PSM PFM is being assessed at different locations, for example, it is not necessarily to fully evaluate each location. In this hybrid approach, one location is fully evaluated. The factors unique to the other locations that make the APF estimates better or worse than the previous evaluation, hence this is the hybrid approach. All right, critical loading, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up just a little bit. In the critical loading approach, teams first discuss the critical loading level for the risk PFM. Tailwater can significantly affect the critical loading level. For example, the maximum high pool may result in a lower differential hydraulic head for initiation of a PFM, and the breach of the reservoir may result in a lower incremental life loss due to the warning and evacuation of the population at risk for uncontrolled spill rate releases prior to breach. In this case, a reservoir level at the spillway crest may be more critical for the differential head and the result in higher incremental life loss. It is suggested the team start the discussion for failure likelihood with the annual exceedance probability of the critical load level and then reduce the probability based on the likelihood of step 
of the step-by-step -step progression leading to failure. Since subsequent nodes in the event tree have probabilities less than one, verbal, verbal probability mapping can be assumed for quick nodal probability estimates. If the AB AP of the flood for the critical loading level is virtually certain to cause failure, then the annual probability of the failure is essentially equal to the AEP of the flood. Each of the risk driver potential failure modes can be listed on a posted note and the different colors kind of help differentiate between the different failure modes. All right, so back to the risk matrix. During the SQRA, teams make order of magnitude estimates for both likelihood of failure and consequences for each risk driver PFM. The results are plotted on the risk matrix. The cells correspond to order of magnitude division and the PFMs are generally plotted on the matrix as boxes of the same size as the grid uh, as the grid to represent the order of magnitude estimates made by the team. The dash red lines on the life safety risk matrix represent the to tolerable risk guidelines discussed in chapter A9, which consider the incremental risk from all PFMs. A similar process can be followed for economics, but there is no tolerable threshold for the economics. The, the statement on the right of the risk matrix corresponds to the order of magnitude plotting position on the vertical scale corresponding to the APF and pr provides perspective on the likelihood of failure. The historical dam failure rate for dams is labeled and the APF between uh, 1 E minus 3 and 1 E minus 2, which corresponds to a likelihood of failure that is more than 10 times higher than the average dam in the US, includes all high significant and low hazard dams built by everyone. Let's talk about uncertainty. An essential part of evaluating is to document any significant sources of uncertainty associated with the estimated probabilities or consequences. The team can uh, the team also should be able to discuss their confidence in the decision to take or not take action to reduce risk or reduce the uncertainty associated with the PFMs. Oops. If the confidence is low, a recommendation for an additional evaluation or investigation may be warranted. To reduce uncertainty, lack of information is not necessarily low consequences. High uncertainty contributes with uh, can combined with low impact on the decision could result in a mo moderate or high confidence category because reducing the uncertainty will not change the decision. All right, we're almost through. For both of the assigned likelihood and consequence category, the rationale should address the appropriate and performance and consequences modeling of the risk drivers and how conditions could be better or worse than modeled. Write the rationale for each PFM for failure likelihood and estimates should include key pieces of evidence and APF estimates and key factors shown in bold. All rationale must be clearly doc document the team's assumptions and understanding so that the different team can review this information at the time of the next periodic assessment of risk or sooner if the incident occurs um, outside of our normal criteria. And then finally, let's go through the summary. The PFMA is the first and most important step in the risk analysis. Review all the background data and performance data. Use diverse team and include operations personnel. Think beyond traditional risk analysis. Uh, PFMA assigns likelihood and, and, and consequence categories using a risk matrix. Provide uh, provide a relevant risk characterization system and risk matrix approach to conduct an SQRA is useful and a quick means to prioritize dam and levy program acti activities, especially to determine if higher level study is beneficial. Thank you, Bart. Does anybody have any questions about potential failure mode descriptions, analysis, SQRA, semi-quantitative risk assessment? Plotting, 